Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our annual Edward Rothman Memorial Lecture. And uh, tonight we have uh, the distinct pleasure to welcome a good friend, a good friend of everybody in this room, my good friend, a good friend of the Institute, and in general, a good person. Um, and that's not a simple thing to say about a lot of people. <coughs> and it's a big pain. Yitzhak Herzog is the son of the sixth president of Israel, Chaim Herzog, and the grandson of Israel's first chief rabbi, Yitzhak, Yitzhak Isaac Levy. Um, <coughs> he starts his bio that way. Because that's, if you know him, both are very, very significant features of, of, of Bush's life. It both represents for him a model of public service, which he was raised into, and which for him has never been a profession. He actually, I can't imagine how much money you lose on a regular basis every time you're in public. Every day you're in public service. Uh, don't tell your wife right now. Uh, but uh, for him to do so in the spirit of both his father and his grandfather, um, exemplars of, of leadership, exemplars of decency, of open-mindedness, speaks so often about his grandfather, who was in many ways one of the great modern Zionist Orthodox rabbis of Israel, who really worked profoundly to try to integrate modernity and the challenges of Zionism in the Halakha. He was born in Israel in 1960 and is an attorney by profession. Bougie was appointed chairman. We call him Bougie in Israel. That's your name. <laughs> Mr. Hertz. Bibi, Bogi. <laughs> I'm stuck with the deal. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> was, was appointed chairman of the executive of the Jewish Agency in Israel in June 2018. He previously served as a member of Knesset um, and for over 15 years, including as chairman of Israel's Labour Party opposition and leading candidate for prime minister in the 215 elections, multiple, multiple ministries, um, was a senior partner in the law firm at Herzog, Fox, and Enron, and for a good part of his life has been trying to do good for the Jewish people. And so before we, before we begin, um, please join me in welcoming, really, one of Israel's finest people, which you have. For zero sum game. It's called Mishak School Ethics. You know how you say win win in Hebrew? Vin vin. It's not good. It's literally, it's like, you're such a good one. Why can't we? It's like everybody's so hungry. Why this is welcome to the Harvard Institute? Thanks for being here. No, you think that it's good. Um, in this room, in addition to some people from some people from Jerusalem, <laughs> what you have here is 200 rabbis of all denominations. Um, also educators and cantors um, from across North America, someone from Brazil, um, and, uh, and a couple of other countries, who are also shlichets of Lord and Emma who come here for what reason? They don't get paid, they actually pay. Um, they come here because they want to serve the Jewish people better. And they know that if they learn, and if they have active minds, and they are able to do their job on another level. And they also come here because Israel is important. And talking about Israel is important. And including conversation about Israel is important. And the people who are come here aren't the people who play it safe by saying, you know what, I'm not going to talk about Israel. So we are in here. We're, we're with a group of friends here tonight. And uh, we want to talk. We want to talk honestly. We want to talk deeply about some of the issues and challenges that we're thinking about and that we're facing. And I want to begin with an easy question, just to warm us up. In Israel, reform is not principally a denomination, but often a derogatory term, denoting and assimilating a mediocre Jew who lives in diasporic mediocre Jews. This is often reflected in statements such as, the Holocaust taking place in North America um, uh, on the part 
part of not just as ranking politicians or a minister here or there, but you can turn it and hear it all the time in Israeli media on an ongoing basis. <coughs> Due to intermarriage, etc. Or a political slogan. Saba Gafomi, Abba Mitbolelu, Yelen Goy. If you have a reformed grandfather, the father will be assimilating and the child will be a Goy. And this was not Hamdi Mashabim or B'nai Blah, but Amir Gila Yadon. Can you take him off to half the name? Yes, but it's something. I mean, what I'm asking is, I don't want to belittle the kids here, but while Israelis have family in the diaspora, they still often see it as lacking health, value, and a future, all of which Zionism positive can be best found in Israel. As a Zionist, I know you don't ascribe to Shida Tegola. You wouldn't be in the position you're in if you did. But to combat it, we need to begin to talk about what we can learn from each other. So to begin, an easy question. Tonight, as in many ways, the ambassador of world jewelry to Israel and Israel to world jewelry as one of the key parts of your job. How do you talk about them to Israelis? What do you believe Israeli Jews and your Judaism can learn from these exemplars of beautiful, beautiful Judaism uh, around the world? Okay, so first of all, I also refer to your initial uh, quotes because I think it's part of a not necessarily understanding where the direction is going. I don't think, look, there's a lot of lack of knowledge of how does Jewish life abroad exist. Whoever grows through the Israeli education system is taught from day one that the worst thing that happened to our people apart from persecution is assimilation. That doesn't mean that you think that all Israelis feel about pluralism or the uh, reform and conservative Judaism in sense. I think predominantly it's lack of knowledge. By the way, we can discuss later on the lack of knowledge in America about Israel. But there is first and foremost lack of knowledge. What people are brought up here to know is that they are part of the Jewish nation. They know and they live through a Jewish circle of life. And they understand and they read and see people's day in day out by the media all the time that Jews in the United States are uh, married with other uh, members of other faiths. And in Hebrew terms, it's called polelut, assimilation. And, and so, so if you're already speaking about, about politicians, put first of all politicians aside. That's the general assumption of Jews in Israel, by the way. Of course, it's an assumption by many Jews in North America. Even Jews, for example, I re recently read a book by Tal Kelet. Tal Kelet is an American-born Israeli who, was, who, who uh, rose to the rank of commander of a squadron in the Air Force, and now is a huge high-tech guy in Manhattan. He's a distinguished member of Rabbi Elliot Cross Girls uh, Community uh, Synagogue. Manhattan, and he wrote a book, God is in the people. He's so worried about where things are going that he wrote, and he found, starts that in two generations now, down the road, exponentially, during the, the Judaism in North America will go down to 16% of what it is now. Now, I must say, even me, okay, who knows a lot, and I learned, I graduated from us in Manhattan, and, and I live with the American Jewish community all my life. And I, my father took me, my mother took me to see all the synagogues of all denominations and the leaders of all of the streams that are here. I didn't understand the unique changes and the wealth of Jewish life in North America until I entered this job. I don't. I, I, how would I know? I go to a synagogue in Pittsburgh where there are 3,000 people doubling together and, and, and at the end of the prayer saying that Filal Shlomo Dina, which my grandfather wrote. No, because I'm not, I haven't experienced it, okay? It's like you guys are here, okay? I hope that in this bubble of Daniel Hartman, you also go and meet the people. You meet the people, you see, it's not so bad. It's not what the New York Times says. That's what Aaron says, there's life here, there's people. 
Same goes out there. I'm extremely impressed, extremely impressed by the wealth of life, the Jewish life in North America. I am by the abundance of books and literature and lectures and centers of learning and discourse and centers of Judaism and the like. And yet, I think that um, aside from the huge sensitivities of being really PC, I think that each community needs to have soul searching. What are its weaknesses? And how do we together preserve the faith of the Jewish people for huge generations to come? Excellent. So let me push again. For example, what would you, you're right. Oh, so Israelis that's the one I said. So what do you tell Israelis. Them? Israelis don't know. No, so I go, what I'm trying to do a lot is to go and, and meet all sides of the ocean, especially opinion makers, <laughs> legislators, rabbis, most extreme orthodox rabbis, etc. to explain to them what it is world jewelry, and especially what it is North American jewelry, including what has happened within the Jewish streams. And I must say that in close quarters and quietly, people are really eager to know. And they say some very interesting things. And they are interested to know more. But because of a certain development in Israeli politics, which I'm trying to change for rabbinic politics, and in America, I, I describe to them how I go into an APAC conference where there are 1,200 rabbis of all denominations, and they're sitting together, Shevet Achim Rachayot Gam And how impressive it is, and how it should be in Israel, and there should be a dialogue. Now one rabbi told me, and please take it seriously, because it's not kind of in any way derogatory, but one rabbi said to me, Lama and Kovim Natsman reforming. Why do they call themselves reforming? Reforming is something that has been stigmatized for hundreds of years in Judaism, and well before the reform movement had its convention in uh, Bohemia, in Cincinnati, in 1865. And so reforming was like the big challenge of getting out of the camp and going for a reformer in Germany. Like, if they call themselves a different name, it may be that. Okay, others say to me, why do you think it's not a different religion? These are issues that need to be taught rather than be bashed, attacked, go to court and all day long, screaming in radio and television. Have a dialogue first on both sides, I say. Okay, have a dialogue, understand how are we one big family together? What are the changes in our people? How do we unify the people? This is difficult, but it's possible. I think many of the programs that we pursue and many others bring people together. For example, if I, if the Jewish agency sends 2,000 counselors now to World Jewelry for the summer, 1,400 of them in the United States and Canada on camps, the best of the best of Israeli life. When they come back home, they tell the story of their first Jewish life in North America. When I send hundreds of shishim, meaning gap year kids, gap year, meaning 18 year old kids before they go to the army, postponing their service for a year and serving and living in the communities <coughs> and experiencing a unique Jewish life of content because it's Jewish life different from Israeli life, they go back home and they tell it to their friends in the army next year and afterwards in college. And then they'll have leadership positions and there will be more of a dialogue. And I expect the same to happen of Masa kids who come here, 14,000 of them here, and say what they've experienced in Israel. There is a major centrifugal force looming over our nation trying to tear it to pieces trying to tear it to pieces, just adding hate all the time. Let's take this comment and that comment. That's why I kind of had a reservation. So somebody said it's a Holocaust. I'm not a, a derogating from the pain that it causes and, and why it is wrong. All I'm saying is if somebody said, so let's explain and let's educate and let's bring people together. And that is why our president Ruby Rifkin thought about a reverse birthright uh, that be, so that we link and bond people further between our nations rather than going reading a, 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 an article in the paper and being all flabbergasted 
and angry without really understanding the facts. And finally, as was said by Rabbi Daniel in the beginning, that reform, and the Milan reforming and reform is like useless as a, something, you know, in a derogatory manner. I don't think it's been used that in the last generation. I think there's a major change in Israel towards more acceptance and understanding of pluralism and openness for new Jewish content. And the best thing to do is simply compete in the market and being more open to understanding the unique nature of what is called Israeli Judaism, which is something of a centrist type Judaism of a combination. And actually, a lot of it started by a Sephardi jury who is much more uh, compromising in many ways. And you see various different ways of life. And I urge you to read the book, it's in Hebrew, called Yadot Israel, Israeli Judaism, published by JPPI. It says to you that 75% of Israelis, you know, huge number, have Kiddush on, uh, on Friday night and observe Yom Kippur, but they also do other things. And I think that's where we need to get to, to compare the two ways of life and see how we have a dialogue on that as well. Over half a million Jews are going to hear something about Israel from the people in this room on Rosh Hashanah. If you figure that only about 202 and a half million go to Shul on Rosh Hashanah, about 20, 25% of what Jews will hear on Rosh Hashanah Kippur is going to be written by the people in this room. Right. What would you want, now we have a chance the other side, what would you want them to say to their community about Israel? Very often, you know, we talk about, can they criticize, involve, support, should it be unconditional, are there boundaries? What demands do you as an Israeli in the name of Jewish people, would you like them to share with their community okay. or expectations? That's a very important uh, question. I thank you for it. I think first and foremost, the primate rule would be love of Israel, Avat Israel in general, meaning that the same way each and every one of you, and I bet you most of you are displeased with American policy, or most of you, not all of you, I understand it fully, but you have criticism. Or if not now, and then in the previous administration. But you always, always loved your country. The same should be for Israel. We are a, an elaborate democracy. We are going through changes like any other nation around the globe. We live in an era where politics are extremely aggressive, where the lowest human denominator of hate and fear looms over the public discourse. That doesn't mean that we have to divorce from Israel. There's nothing like Israel in the world, nothing like it. Nothing you can compare it to because it is a unique nation of a unique people gathered together after an incredible and painful history. That, so therefore, rather than detach yourself, join in and, and join the argument, join the debate if you have something to say. Number two, there's a lot of things that have been distorted in recent years. This is a very impressive democracy. Way beyond people get it. I, I, I'll annoy you, some of you, the Americans. We don't have a shutdown. We don't have any, we, we have full limitation of carrying arms, okay? Uh, we don't have a, 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 a pro-life or no-life issues here. We have other problems that we deal with. We send our kids to the army because we fight people who are out there to get us, okay? And let's not be naive about it. There's a sea of people out there who hate us. And there are, there's a sea out there who also wants to make peace with us. So these are complex circumstances of life. And all I'm trying to say is that we're impressed. We have a prime minister who's going through a difficult uh, uh, legal issues that very few leaders around the world go through. And we have an open and vibrant democracy so that the Muslim Brotherhood is represented in our parliament and it's not allowed anywhere in the world. And in the worst of the worst of vile terror of the worst animals on human being health, uh, uh, some people go and get up in the parliament and support them. So therefore, before judging Israel, because somebody decided to write a piece in Israel, how bad Israel is, let's judge the positive sides of Israel. This is a very solidaric society. 
people here are more to the right. Whether I like it or not, I take it as a fact of life which I recognize because uh, whenever they tried to go further, they were uh, uh, replied by terror. When they pulled up settlements and uprooted them after they lived there for tens of years and we were, pro were promised peace, we got missiles on our head. And that's why the average citizen says to himself, wait a minute, I want to be careful. This is our duty to understand the national psyche. That doesn't mean that because of it, Israel is the bad, is the wrong, is, is, the, is the evil in the story. It's a very complicated circumstances of the story that needs to be learned and delved into deeply. Unfortunately, some of our children out there, when they go to college, they're swamped by messages and brainwash and attacks and they're mind boggled and they don't know the truth so they want to run away. So let's work hard to explain to me the tr them the truth, that there is a debate in Israel about it, that there are major questions about the other side and its willingness to make peace, that the region is changing into a coalition of nations who sees Iran as their biggest threat possible to world peace in, in general, to Israel in specific. And that's why let's put things in perspective so they understand that Israel is something even metaphysical. Something incredible, that without it, who knows where American jury will be. And that's why, the way I see it, anyway. I want to move to... Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> that's called Hachnasat Urchim and Respect. <laughs> Welcome. Um, I want to move to a question that I never talk about, and uh, on, on anti-Semitism. I don't talk about it, and I don't think about it, because I was raised not to think about it. Um, well, interestingly, why you were raised not to think about uh, That's a whole thing I'll tell you about it another time. Um, but uh, um, a lot of it had to do with the sense that the challenge of Judaism is how to incorporate the gifts of modernity. And as a result, you wanted to see the positive sides of modernity and not the negative sides of modernity. Um, my father, as he was moving away from an ultra-Orthodox upbringing, as he's bracing modernity, Anti-Semitism is the dark side of modernity, and so it, so, so there's an interesting. And I don't know how many people <laughs> met Rabbi David Hart. Many of them were Shalom, his students, but he was a real giant. <laughs> many of them here were his students as well, um, and so I was raised just to not think about it. But it's getting harder not to think about it. True. Um, I don't. I'm not existentially frightened yet, and I, I don't like overstating it because until. North American Jews, as distinct from European Jews in England or France, North American Jews, while now it's real and frightening, they're still not selling real estate businesses. So it's not, it's a good test. You know, Jews were never in the real estate business. You know, they're not selling real estate. But there is this increased fear that it's not just on a corner, it's not just Islamic terror, it's not just in the Middle East. Oh. Hatred to Jews has come back. What does it mean? How to talk about it, how to think about it, how to respond? is a serious question, and, and one of the issues between Israel and world Jewry is how do we talk about this together? What are some of your thoughts on this issue? So first let me start actually with somewhere which is not in the United States, but is hitting a lot of news tonight. Um, there was a, an investigative report or a major uh, documentary in the BBC in the last few days uh, depicting the in-depth anti-Semitism in the British Labour Party. So actually, I'd, I think we can take it as an example. One of the two major pillars of British democracy that we like to look up to as, a, as an example of an impressive democracy is ridden to its, you know, to its bones with anti-Semitism. The British Labour Party where most of the Jewish community, remember the comparison, felt at home, which had very close ties to my sister party, the Labour Party, is all of a sudden fully exposed with enormous hate and anti-Semitism. And it's mind-boggling, extremely disturbing, and extremely dangerous, and needs to be dealt with immediately uh, with no ifs and buts. And I think it's also a major challenge from the British political system. But what I want to say about it is that when Jeremy Corbyn was elected, 
I was chairman of labor and chairman of the opposition in Israel, and I invited Jeremy Corbyn, following certain comments of his on the Holocaust, to Yad Vashem. Come and learn and see in Yad Vashem. And I never got a reply. Never, ever. And he never bothered to come and see it here. And I say to myself, when you see in this documentary how young Jewish activists are attacked all the time on the Holocaust, you know, the, the Germans didn't finish their job and things like that in Britain, and you're all shocked. Now, what, present, what pre prevents that from being anywhere else? We have young Jews in the North America who should think the following. The New World never had any bloodshed of Jews because they were Jewish until this year. You believe it? We live now in an era where 12 Jews were murdered in America for being Jewish in their synagogues. So you can say, I'm in deniability, I won't deal with it. But you can say, okay, we realize something's happening, let's deal with it. America is strong enough to deal with it with le in the legal sense, in the public sense, with a lot of allies from all of the communal forces. I was extremely impressed to see in Pittsburgh how the Muslim community came over to pay tribute and others. But at the end, there is a phenomena. There is lurking anti-Semitism. And it, at the end, has nothing to do with Israel or the conflict. It goes way beyond that because it was always there. And that's what we need to deal with and understand that there is a risk and we need to, de to deal with it with, uh, uh, you know, with no mercy. The, one of the interesting um, struggles that many North American Jews have is actually Israel's tolerance for anti-Semitism. As long as that person is pro-Israel, you said anti-Semitism is separate. What do you feel, whether it's in Hungary? Had Israel very often who wants to be the homeland of the Jewish people, increasingly I hear from Jews in North America, you, what, you're, you're the homeland of the Jewish people. How could you be embracing anti-Semitism, so recognizing it or declaring I it? I don't think... What do you uh, think we should do? First of all, I know what you're alluding to. You're alluding to relations that Israel has with uh, Hungary, Poland. Austria. And, no, Austria is more Austria, complex. Yeah. Let's put, first of all, things in perspective. Austria... Councillor Kurz and his party are not anti-Semitic, but they brought in a partner into the coalition, which was Haider's party and Stach's party, and Israel's banning that party all uh, totally, and the foreign ministers from that party. So actually our ambassador is not allowed to meet or talk at all. In Hungary, <coughs> Poland, let's put, Poland became a big issue here, very painful issue. Uh, because of the legislation, and there's a whole debate with Poland, and I think the Israeli political system has been very aggressive against it. It's true that there is an American interest here, American interest on NATO, which uh, kind of put it into a certain uh, limitation. I raised it with the highest officials of the United States in the past, and I think they also delivered the message on behalf of many Israelis to the leadership of Poland. And that is why President Duda met also and spoke with President Rivlin. And Hungary is an issue, big issue, which has been discussed here. Not yet clear to the Israelis because nobody understands uh, the background that you've been referring to. Definitely not in the current era, there's no sense of anti-Semitism. We're talking about the origins of the party and the leader. So I think that's been taken, care in, uh, taken into account, but I don't want to run shy away and tell you that it's perfect. It's not perfect. It's complicated, and many Israelis are raising eyebrows about it. If you were prime minister, it would be a little more careful. <laughs> that's why I want to ask Next you now. Question. Next question. <laughs> I, want to I, I want to ask to political questions, and then open it to the audience. I remember um, when you were head of the opposition, you considered entering into a unity government with Prime Minister Netanyahu and the Likud party. True. Before Netanyahu, the issue of before the issue was, can we sit with the prime minister under indictment, which is a separate issue, let's leave that aside for now. 
Um, he wasn't then indicted or investigated. It wasn't nothing to do. It was just not the issue. Right. And within your party, you were severely critiqued, and that was the cause for your, in many ways, political downfall. That's true. Because you dared to do that. Um, in a culture of bipartisanship, where the other is always wrong, the other is someone you can't talk to, the other one is the only one, is your job is to replace them and to defeat them, you try to go a very unpopular path. Um, you paid a price for it. I think all of Israel paid a price for it because I think we were better when you were in your position. I think uh, I liked Israel. I felt better when you were in your position. Um, that issue might come up again at the end of this next election. Um, what do you, explain what was under your mind, and in your mind, and do you, how do you justify or legitimize or explain that type of countercultural move in our generation? Look, we live in a, a, we live in a region which requires major dramatic steps to change. I can go and lecture about that for a whole day, so I won't explain too much. But towards the end of 2015, there was an opportunity that started. We were approached, both Netanyahu and I, by leaders from the region who begged us to go into a process. It was an Obama administration. It was after a wave of terror that erupted in the, in the spring summer of 2015. And the idea was that if we can go together, the extremists on the right will be diluted and there will be an ability to create a platform of a certain process with the Palestinians. But the truth of the matter is it was also a major possible breakthrough with the region. I traveled with Netanyahu during that process, which culminated in May 16, I, I traveled with Netanyahu in the region, and we met leaders, and we discussed it with them, and the potential was historical. And I said, I'm not missing that historical opportunity. I think that is my duty to prevent further bloodshed from our children. This is the way I see it, period. And therefore, if I can get to a deal whereby we will have certain agreements with the Palestinians to get them into a process under the realm of an international conference whereby nation states from the region will be represented, it will be extremely dramatic. So both Netanyahu and I had the process. There were a lot of leaks and a lot of attacks, and both of us were heavily attacked by both sides. And we negotiated, and it became extremely difficult when we got to the peak of it in May 16, just after Yom Ha'atzmaut. And, and it melted down at the end because Netanyahu was pressured heavily by the settlers to pull back, and he simply pulled back from the paper we agreed on, which, by the way, was supported by world leaders, including the White House. And my, me, I was heavily attacked by my, the left wing of my party in a very aggressive way, a short-sighted way, which led to kind of the other sides assuming that I won't deliver in the Knesset and led to the collapse of the process. Clearly led to my uh, demise as, uh, the, I would say, the then leader of the Labour Party, and uh, that's why I lost my leadership race again in 2017. Uh, but you see, no great achievements were reached since then in labor. In any case, I say the following. I did that because I believe that in order to meet the historical challenges of the era, and by the way, also in the past, it's better that the two major political forces in Israel the strongest centrist forces should go together. I am an adamant believer in national unity government, adamant. I believe it leads to a, different, a certain lucidity, balance, and uh, serves most of the desire of the nation which is in the center. I hope it will happen in the future. Uh, and I say also when it regards to, with regards to the issues that we care about as uh, pluralistic. I think all in all, a lot of positive things can come out from the fact that mainstream Israel is, in, is running Israel. 
and not letting the uh, sidelines push it uh, to the side. One last question. Um, that was the last possible hope. In, but in you see, the Almighty put me in a different position. It's not so, so bad. It's not so bad. <laughs> You get to come here, right? Then it was harder. The last Review. time you in the other position, you gave us a half yeah, hour. Now you're relaxed. We have plenty shamayim. of time. You teach. Shamayim. Right. <laughs> and Ashrei HaMa'amin. Yes. Now, uh, <laughs> but turning... Donnie and I have theological discourse <laughs> about a lot of issues. <laughs> I want to talk about the peace process for a moment because that was a, there was a chance. And you were willing to sacrifice your political career and endanger it for the possibility of doing good. Absolutely. That was clear. Now we're in a situation where most Israelis believe that peace is impossible. It's not possible. It's not going to happen. Um, maybe we would like it. Maybe if a, if a deal was put on the table, we would accept a two-state solution. But the vast majority of Israelis pull and say it's not going to happen in our lifetime. What do you feel about that perspective? And more significantly, if it's not going to happen, since one solution could be a kol bidei shamayim, <laughs> the other in is God helps those who, helps them, who help themselves. What do you think we Israelis, Israel, the Jewish people, ought to do in the meantime? Waiting for the messianic era, waiting for utopia, but in the meantime, the situation is untenable, has profound moral consequences. What's your advice to Israel and the Jewish no, people? The situation is extremely complex, but it can change overnight. You know, when Sadat came, it, it, it changed overnight. When Gorbachev fell, it changed overnight. Things that nobody expected, by the way. There were huge efforts done in the last 30 years to move on the pro in, with the process. And there are positive developments and there are negative developments. First of all, there's a Palestinian authority out there. There's a Palestinian government that has the ability, if it wanted to, to rise to the occasion and move further for peace. There's also a demand from the Israeli side to do that. So long as on that side they're playing angry and hard to get, here on this side it serves also people who say, don't move, you don't need to do anything, why bother? So it's, it's like a, a, a vicious cycle all the time. On the other hand, the region has opened up to Israel. Whoever would have dreamt, and you, most of you remember history, that, for example, we will have a, a strong coalition with major nations in the region, or Sunni nations, because of the threat of Iran. Basically, once the agreement with Iran was signed by the superpowers, the whole region moved towards Israel to save them from a hungry, dangerous, uh, aggressive alliance called Iran. So I can't say that it's over and out. I'm not willing to say it no matter what. I actually believe that if there is leadership on both sides that is willing to be bold enough, it will happen. It will happen because the, the majority of the, of the human beings want peace. They are, they are not advocating for it because they don't see any hope right now because they're like depressed that there's nobody who's going to move towards that direction. But it doesn't mean that there's no desire. I will say something else. When you walk around the streets in this country, not only in Jerusalem, but throughout the country, you will see a mixture of opinions. And what, meaning that the fact that somebody votes Netanyahu, for example, doesn't mean that he doesn't think there will be peace. Me thinks perhaps that Netanyahu can deliver him the better, a better deal, or things like that. Or if somebody votes uh, by TUD, that doesn't mean he is absolutely uh, adamantly against uh, national unity with the left. It's people are mixed and live together in so many ways. All groups of Israeli society are simmering from within. All groups are debating. All groups have media outlets. You need to learn them and read them and understand them to see, wow, I didn't think there's such a debate in the Zionist religious community or in the new immigrants community, the Arab community or the Haredi community. Wow, I didn't know that there are changes in the Haredi community. Meaning, that's why I'm more optimistic because I believe there's a historical movement all the time towards a change and change at the end will, will come about. Now, 
the disappointment of Israelis as to a potential peace process, I explained to you before, is definitely explicable, definitely understandable. But the desire to cut the umbilical cord and get out of this vicious circle also is there. Look at Gaza. Gaza is a huge tragedy. It's a huge tragedy. Every time you try to move and do something, something ruins it. And it's a regime, the worst kind of regime, atrocious dictatorship. Women are, are oppressed there. And it's a mini terror state, a base for Iran. It's very complicated for Israelis to see another step if they don't know where to lead to and that there's a serious partner on the other side who's willing to be tough enough and adhere to peace and recognize the Jews' uh, right for self-determination. So last, and two weeks ago, there was a dramatic event in Bahrain. There was a conference convened by the United States and the foreign minister of Bahrain gives an interview to an Israeli TV channel and says, the, the Israel is a fact of life and definitely has a right to exist in our region. Now, this we never saw before. I'm not saying that it's already a world-changing issue. I'm just saying there are changes. We need to seize the moment. And in order to seize the moment, we need to be bold and project a sense of hope for the next generation. My agenda in the election of 2015 was that the first thing I do, I go to Ramallah and speak to the Palestinian youth. But people are afraid to say it in Israel these days and would like to kind of leave it for the later on, to discuss it later on, because these are all theoretical questions which bring the Israelis into a kind of a position. Are you lefty? Are you righty? It has nothing to do with it. It was Begin who pulled out of, as Amos Oz in his last speech wrote, and I urge you to read my excellent piece in Haaretz in English just about two weeks ago about his last book. Amos Oz got there in his last speech and said, I'm optimistic because it was a pacifist, it was a pacifist, vegetarian, uh, left-leaning Jewish-Israeli leader, Levi Shkol, who became the king of the biggest Jewish empire ever in 1967. And it was the commissioner of Beitar and Jabotinsky in Poland was the first one to pull out of territory 10 years later in Sinai, Menachem Begin. So life is complicated, and I'm still hoping that there will be change. Thank you. And now it's your turn. I'm going to start with this side, and we'll go back and forth, and everybody take a breath, get a chance to ask your question. Yes, sir, please, begin. Just say who you are. Don't get up. You don't, don't have to get, get up. up. Sit down. You were good. Say uh, who you are. Jesse, my name is Jesse Gordon. Um, and what do you do? I'm a teacher. Okay, good. Good. So other than finding a very tall, gray-haired general, what can labor do to recapture the American? No, no, don't ask me about labor. I'm the chairman of the Jewish Agency. I'm not a political commentator. And Benny Gantz was chief of staff. And he's leading blue and white. And labor was just elected Amir Peretz. And all, they're all good people, and uh, you see what they're doing. Each one is leading his campaign. Well, the campaign, because it's summer, it's hot, and people want to be on vacation, the real fire of, in the belly of the campaign will be in the beginning of September, in my mind. Yes, please, in the back. Sam Kiefer, Margate, Florida. Um, Rabbi, can you comment on the, uh, the current Ethiopian situation? Assure us that things are happening to improve their situation. In Israel, you mean? Because there are two issues. Look, it, I, would, I don't like to call it Ethiopian situation. These are Israelis whose grandparents and parents made Aliyah. Uh, I don't want to single out... I, I don't want to single out anyone, but one of our top officers is here. Her name is Prina Ginao. Prina, sorry, but uh, Prina, it was one of our main emissaries on campuses, and she's our deputy head of strategy. And we, and I don't, you were not born in Ethiopia, right? Or I were. But Prina, for example, 
is uh, uh, there's a, a, the demonstrators were a young generation Israelis who came from Ethiopia, but there is, uh, their parents came, but they're absolute Israelis. And we've been discussing it at depth, with, including with Plina and others, how far should we discuss it as an issue of Aliyah? It's not an issue of Aliyah anymore. It's an issue within Israeli society where Israelis of Ethiopian origin feel discriminated against. Objectively or subjectively? I think objectively. I think there is a lot of events of discrimination that are un absolutely unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable. I've been, I was the head of the caucus of Israelis of Ethiopian origin in the Knesset because I took it as a major issue of mine. And uh, all I can say is that I think it's a, that it's a very positive step, these de demonstrations, because people express themselves. Now, please, please, don't compare it to anything you know from the United States. There is a lot of connection and a lot of friendship and people in the army together, a lot of things, but there are things to me that must be improved. And uh, so they're all being discussed now in a very strong way in the media, and I think it's very helpful. And I hope it will calm down and relax, and that uh, more and more improvement will uh, be apparent in our society. It's one of the most amazing, amazing aliyot uh, in Israel's history. It was, was I, I mean, whenever I read and hear about these efforts of making aliyah and walking 3,000 kilometers, uh, by foot to the home, ancient homeland is amazing to me. Um, yes, we will take a third question here and then we'll go to this side. Yes, please. Please. Right here. I'm sorry. Um, my, my name is Steve Kane. I'm a rabbi in Westchester area in New York. Which, in a, well, just say this. Briarcliff Manor, New York. It's Congregation a, Sons of Israel. Okay. Uh, it's the only one in town, actually. So, um, so this, my question is about something that I think, although in very different ways, affects both Israelis and diaspora Jewry tremendously. And I'm wondering what your stance on it is. And that is, do you think it is time um, for the Rabbanut to be dismantled? If the answer is no, why not? And if the answer is yes, are you willing to take a more public stance on it? So listen, I think that uh, you're putting me in a trap. <laughs> my, my, look, I, my, my, I bear the By the name. way, you could relax. We're not going to tell anybody. I <laughs> we're just going to put it on the internet, but we're not going to tell anybody. I bear the name of my grandfather, who was a holy man and illustrious, uh, illustrious religious leader, and he was the chief rabbi, first chief rabbi of the country. So it's very complicated for me to be judgmental. There are many people who respect the Rabbanut and many people who are very angry at the Rabbanut. I challenge the Rabbanut on many fronts, especially on the discourse with all the streams and especially on the issues of Giyu. And I think that uh, there, is a, an, a, there is still an ability to have a dialogue, in-depth dialogue about it. The whole question of religion and state is going to be something really big in the elections as you can see, and because of it, I would be cautious in, what, in not giving you a, an in-depth answer because it will simply serve people's agendas in the elections. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. But I'll talk to you privately. Bro. I'm going to try and ask you, and it's okay. You could say you don't want to talk about it, but I want to be more specific. <laughs> would you be? Do you agree? Forget about the dismantling of the chief rabbinate. Do you I think, think that's rabbis a technical of, issue. Do you think rabbis of other denominations should be part of the Israeli chief rabbinate? I think that uh, pluralism must be the rule of the land. I think we must enable equality between the streams. And I never hid it. I believe in uh, be, being able to hold all Jews together under one tent. Um, yes, ma'am, in the back. Yes, sure. So he, his father taught at Dropsy, I thought. Yeah. No? Um, Dropsy College, was it? I believe so, yes. Yeah. 
So thank you for your words that you just said. And this is such a wonderful place of pluralism where we all get to learn together and be together. And we love your words. How are your words going to be translated into budgetary concerns so that the streams in Israel, our beloved colleagues who work here, who are not Orthodox, will see more money in their programming and in their budget? Because of the uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, opinions, there is a demand for equality. Because of the relative small size of the streams, in some instances, they are budgeted by small sums. I was the only minister in the government, or the first one, to allot synagogues to the streams, and I even attended one this week, a conservative one in, in Modin. Um, we, the Jewish agency, we, the, we support the streams, in a couple of millions do of dollars, all the streams, in projects, educational projects and the like, as representing world Jewry. Um, but at the end of it all, there's I, I tell you, there's all the time constant movement. The, in the previous question and your questions take into account that, you know, because the establishment is still uh, bound by coalition agreements to orthodox parties, that means that perhaps or there's a hinting there that pluralism is not on the grow. But it is growing in Israel all the time. New communities, new dialogue, people are learning. And a lot of instances, even the recent ruling of the military to enable a, a rabbi from other streams, let's hope they won't need it. All I'm saying is that you have to look at the historical processes. This nation is mostly not orthodox, but has the, the uh, orthodox establishment control private life. But in America, North America, you have the majority conservative and reform, and the biggest issue is, why be a Jew? You know it. Your problem is 70% unaffiliated. You're our problem, our joint problem. We, the Jewish Agency, we are the largest Jewish organization in the world, and what we do day in, day out is connect Jews, Jewish identity programs. We send you our emissaries to your congregations. We invite you to, invi to, to take more. And we have emissaries on campuses who are fighting and are for our good names and many other projects that we call partnerships, partnerships with communities, partnerships with families, an abundance of issues, only to sit so that our people get to know each other better. Many Israelis didn't deal with this issue. You should know that the reform movement first appeared in our life in Israel in 1962. They went first time to court. That means there was something else before. It was actually originally a very not Zionistic movement. Let's also remember that. Until, emer until Stephen Wise and, uh, and Abayel Siver emerged as the greatest Zionist leaders. So these are historical processes. You, uh, I understand it's a frustration out of love and affection to Israel. But that doesn't mean that Israel was not there in a different structure in those days. And that's why we need to think how to create a dialogue constantly. And my, part of my mission is to ease the tension and bring people together to speak quietly to each other. Please. I'm going to go to this side now. Yes, please, in the back. Hi, I'm Rabbi Jackie Satlow from UMass in Dartmouth, Mass. Um, I want to ask you about the Kotel. Um, so several years ago, there was um, an agreement, a compromise um, that um, w was agreed to. And since then, it seems like nothing's happened with it. So um, could you comment on that? And sure. Okay. So first, let me explain the historical context so people understand. Actually, the the, copy, the copyrights for the arrangement in the Kotel uh, are belonging to me. I was the cabinet secretary of Ehud Barak's government in 1999. There was a huge demonstration of a conservative congregation in Jerusalem in the Kotel, and the Minister of Religious Affairs from Shas, who's now the Deputy Minister of Finance, called me, and the whole, the, 
discussion ensued. What do we do about it? Fast forward to cut the long story short, I got everybody's consent from the, mo from the Orthodox rabbis all the way down to the streams to hold the prayers in Robinson's Arch, which is the alternative Kotel. It's not really an alternative. It's another slice of the Kotel, simple as that. By the way, beautiful site. I urge you to visit it. It has the stones, burnt the stones of Titus. You can see the fire that hit the, the wall of the, uh, of the temple. And what happened was that it, it went really well for 20 years. Then there was a local judge who gave a ruling a couple of years ago that banned the usage of this place because of antiquities or zoning and planning. And this led to the fight, parallel to the fight of the women of the wall. Although the Supreme Court of Israel rejected their plea and said, go to the site. And it led to a whole discussion and a debate. And the current Attorney General of Israel, who was then the Cabinet Secretary, carved out a compromise which everybody agreed to and the government of Israel uh, accepted unanimously, or almost unanimously, which was the best thing possible to reach for uh, you know, peace and tranquility in the Jewish people, unfortunately because of a lot of mistakes of many parties concerned, and I don't want to go into it. The, uh, the genie came out of the bottle. Attacks started on the Haredi members of the Knesset and ministers. They were under huge pressure. They advised Netanyahu that if he doesn't rescind the resolution, they will, the government will fall. And this led to the rescinding of the agreement, which led to the biggest pain and rift between Israel and world Jewry, especially Israel and North American Jewry. Since then, two years have gone by. Actually, in, during that crisis, a lot of this was had, ha, handled by my predecessor, Nathan Sharansky, who has done incredible work. But since then, the government has acted unilaterally, in, somewhat in conjunction with the streams, to upgrade the alternative site. There's construction there. And, uh, and, uh, and to create a, a pleasant prayer, praying circumstances. And, uh, and that's where it is right now. Unfortunately, there's so much politics in it, a lot of re local government politics. And, it's been, and we are all trying, together with uh, various government officials, to pull it up and, up and finish the, the construction work that needs to be taken. For the, uh, Netanyahu gave instructions to move it forward. There was a lot of battles in within his government, and it's moving very slowly. You can still go pray there, but it's not upgraded as it should be. Yes, please. I'm Daniel Graber. Uh, I'll introduce myself as the former director of Camp Ramah in California, so I had uh, several hundred shlichim from the Jewish Agency over many years. And uh, I'm now the rabbi of a conservative and orthodox synagogue in Durham, North Carolina. That's wonderful. Because uh, I have good friends in Durham. So I'll see come visit. Doc. Come visit. Uh, and um, I, I appreciated your remarks about how the issues between American, the American Jewish community and the Israeli Jewish community, that we need to educate around that. Um, and I think that the idea of a reverse birthright is a good idea, but I also have spent um, many years, I studied at the Mendel Institute, and, um, and I'm aware that the education about the American Jewish community is absent from the Israeli curriculum. So the story, my synagogue is 135 years old. Amazing. It has its own history. Our community has leaders and thinkers, Heschel, uh, Eugene Borowitz, Elliot Dorf is a teacher of mine. These are great minds who have given great ideas to the world and there's a history. And so while I appreciate the one-to-one -one or the face-to-face -face efforts, uh, ultimately it's not going to create systemic change. So I'd love to hear from you um, how it is that 
education, as you said, which is so important, about the American Jewish community can make its way into the Israeli curriculum so that our community is not absent or not uh, just a caricature of what we are. So there is a, a major change. It's a very good suggestion. And uh, you're, uh, it's an open door because we've agreed with Naftali Bennett as Minister of the, the Education and also Minister of Diaspora Affairs on a, uh, on a curriculum for sixth and seventh graders throughout the country which is now in implementation, right, Nina? Right, it's now in implementation. Do you know much about it? So please say, get up and say a few words about it, because I, I just know that it was approved. Nina Aguina will so, explain. Uh, we have actually um, um, we have a really wide initiative that's grow up after the Kotel crisis, that it's actually educating and making awareness among the Israeli society. And we understood that you need to tackle down the young generation in Israel education. So when you split it in Israel, it's the formal education with the Ministry of Education. We, we have a great collaboration with them. They put funding as well as we do. And uh, right now, the implementation is from uh, sixth grade to uh, from f second grade to eighth grade. Sorry. And we just finished, uh, actually, today I just read a report back to UGA Federation about the 20. Um, uh, classes workshop that we developed together with six educators from the United States and six educators from Israel because we care about, you know, your thinker, as you said. So the uh, American educator brought Eshel, et cetera, and their point of view. We put them together and we have a curriculum of 20 classes that we can share with the Ministry of Education to uh, 1,500 schools, Mamlachti uh, schools in Israel, the secular schools. So this is going on right now. And I can tell you from personal story, that my son in his school in Modi'in, the, the principal just told me that they're doing with the fifth grade and sixth grade something about Jewish peoplehood. She doesn't understand what, but they have something from the Minister of Education. So I'm glad to see personally that it's went through and it's happening. So we're getting there. And with the informal education, we have a great collaboration with the Council for Youth uh, Organization and the Council for Youth Movements and the Mechinot. They all get in curriculum through us. And right now, we're working on the right mentor for each of them because they work differently. So it's happening. And I will add, that's very good. Thank you, Prina, because I didn't know anything about it. So it's great. All I can say is that um, it, it is it is quite remarkable because this is the change. It should be more, but it's a good start, a very good start. And I urge you, Daniel, if you want, Brina can bring you uh, the, uh, the few leaders in the Ministry of Education who are in charge. Yuval Seri and Adia Alomi with Brina. If you want to hear more, and invite them here and you know speak to them about it because it's really important. Okay, we're, we're coming more to the end, so we just, right. I apologize, a lot of hands, last we'll two take questions, like, yes, please. Yeah, last three questions, you decide who. I don't know if this is a question. My name is R Rabbi Alan Katz from Rochester, New York. I'm past chair of the partnership uh, with Rochester and Modi'in. And it's also on us, because our partnership community, together with Modi'in, worked to develop the Chavirim uh, Evaliyam, and it's part of the curriculum in Modi'in that the mayor has backed and put money into, and the students from fifth grade and on, and one of the things I do, and other rabbis can do this in communities that have your connections, the educators will invite you into the schools to talk about diaspora Jewry, and it's something that, so it's on us as much as it is on them, but they will receive it. And I will add another two programs. We have a twinning school program of hundreds of schools. And we have a grandparents, grandchildren program in the partnership. We bring grandparents and grandchildren to meet uh, parallel colleagues on both sides. It's all part of this big unity uh, wave. Again, just the hands that I saw the last two. Yourself, sir, and then um, the last one, Vernon, please. Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Marvin Hirschhorn from Concordia University in Montreal. Department of Political Science. <clears throat> we were the university, by the way, that stopped Benjamin Netanyahu from speaking. Um, the question I want to ask you is that every March, we have Israel Apartheid Week, and more and more our students and faculty, Jewish students and faculty, 
disengaged from the process. They just don't want to be involved in that. And that week, you have filled with hatred, anti-Semitism, the BDS movement. How do you deal with that if a community wants to disengage? There's a major effort on behalf of many parties concerned uh, or trying to deal with it. Nina, were you an Israel fellow? Okay, so we have Israel fellows on campuses all over, about 96 all over the United States, North America, who are out there, they're working with other entities such as Stand With Us and Chabad and Hillel, of course, and Maccabees, etc. We work together as much as we can. It's a, it's a Heraclean process at times. Because you, you, as you said correctly, they, those in the middle, they don't want to be there. They don't know what to do with it. They're confused. It's really challenging, by the way. Because I say to you, actually, in light of what your first comment is, as I mentioned in the beginning, you can criticize Netanyahu that you cannot accept a delegitimization of the right of the Jewish people for self-determination. This is what's underneath all of this. Some of these are naive people. They are brainwashed. Some care. They want to change the world. That's legit. You want to change the world. You want to make it better. We sat yesterday with Pnina and her colleagues, who are fellows of the Mandel program in, in the Jewish Agency, and we discussed because of their experiences of being our emissaries on, all over the world and what it means for a young Jew to join and support the Palestinian cause, not because he knows, because it gives him a certain sense it's of, of change. So we need to think what other options do we offer them in order to be aligned with the Jewish people and say, yes, there is a debate. We should argue, we can argue, but that doesn't, should not derogate from Avat Israel that you should have. This is the whole issue of intersectionality. The fact that Jews are banned from fraternities because they say I'm a Zionist or a Jew. Because Jewish women were, were we're not allowed to march in the march now in Washington. We should raise our head a bit, look from the balcony down, and see that there are phenomena that were never there before. And we should discuss it and see how they deal with it. Last question, Vernon, please. So yeah. Rabbi Vernon Kurtz is a member of our Board of Governors. He's a really great mensch. And he's now made Aliyah last month. So we welcome him. I think I can sit down right now. I want you to add, if I may, just for something to Vanina's work because we work together. There is something called the Ami Unity Committee, part of the, the Unity of the Jewish People Committee, which Bougie chairs and which I sit on. And the Ami Unity Committee is dealing exactly with the issue which you raised, that, that exactly to try to get education through the gap years, through the youth school, through the youth groups, and to, uh, through the schools, etc., recognizing that Israelis have to learn about diaspora Jews as well. Bougie, I'd ask you to, to comment on the work of the Jewish age in what's now called emerging communities, the Budaya, and those kind of communities that longed for some Jewishness and relationships to Israel and have difficulties both in conversion and the interior ministry, but still want to be part of our people. Latin America. So part, yeah, all part, over the world, correct. So that's it. So part of, if you want to add some new interesting challenges to the story of the Jewish people, so I initiated a big di uh, discussion in our unity committee just about two weeks ago on the emerging communities. So there was a committee which was appointed by Minister Bennett a few years ago to see how many communities there are and, and human beings there are who say they, they are either, they want to be Jewish, they're Jewish, leave aside the question of North American uh, issues of conversion. So turns out, if you look all around the world, from Papua New Guinea to the heart of Africa, to Latin America, especially the Amazonas and North Brazil, and uh, North and uh, Central America, uh, South and Central America, you get to 60 million human beings who have a certain connection from on the spectrum from small connections all the way up to full connection to Judaism. I can tell you that recently I met an Israeli researcher who said to me that the Maoris in New Zealand are also Jews, and they're not in the list. So this is really fascinating, because there is, for example, a tribe in, in Uganda called Abu Yadaya, which has been recognized by the conservative movement 
which about a, well over 100 years ago, there was a king who decided he wants to be Jewish. And they fully practiced Judaism, as opposed to in, in, in El Salvador or in Nicaragua, people who have Jewish traits, but you don't know if they really are Jewish. Now, because of the example of what we have with the sons of Menashe, Bnei Menashe, who we bring on the border between India and, uh, and I think India and some, not the Himalayas out there, or uh, the Ethiopian Jewry, of course, which has a huge history, which was my grandfather's ruling in 1954 to bring all of them to Israel. Then these are huge dilemmas. As part of the what I'm leading in the Jewish agency, which is a major change process, which Rabbi Hartman attended himself a month ago in New Jersey, uh, we are, are discussing the future of the Jewish people. Where will it be a hundred years down the road? And part of it will be what are we doing with people who are entering our nation who are part of our nations and not recognized as such? They, this is a strategic issue which is not being dealt with on a strategic level by the government of Israel Bechlal in general. If they just dealt with each issue separately. And these are issues that must be discussed big time by the Jewish people and see what's our opinion about it. There's also about a million Jews of color in uh, the Jewish world these days. So these are very interesting things. It's actually what gives me a certain sense of real mission to see how we deal with these questions because you have to go through the whole spectrum. Same in Latin America. I'm not even speaking about communities in Argentina which Baron Hirsch brought and they are dwelling down and fully, fully kind of mixed. But mostly ancient communities out there who are practicing Judaism and have not been attended to. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you Thank for you. joining us. Please.